Hello and welcome back to the third and final part of today's show. We're having a look at the outlook for North Asia in general and China specifically. To discuss that, I'm joined from Singapore by Jinping Chia. He is head of China A Investments Business Strategy and Development at Invesco. And we're joined from Tokyo by Cameron Sistermans, head of asset allocation for Asia at Mercer. Cameron, let's start with you. Uh, what are the big strategic themes for Mercer when it comes to North Asia? So I think a key theme that we are uh, facing this year, uh, largely around the globe, is, is really a transition from a highly accommodative uh, fiscal and monetary policy environment into one which is much less accommodative, um, largely in response to you know above in central bank target inflation in, in many developed markets, particularly the US where it's a multi-decade highs. Um, and so obviously that has a lot of implications for uh, investors' portfolios and how they think about resilience to inflation um, and so on. But I guess, as, as, as John mentioned in, in the last session, we are seeing uh, a little bit of a, a sort of a nuance or, or a bit of a different experience here in, in Asia where you know, inflation is, is generally outside of, say, India and Korea, um, below central bank targets. Um, and that's sort of enabling, I guess, the, the central banks here, uh, particularly the People's Bank of China and the Bank of Japan to retain uh, their monetary uh, policy easing biases. Um, so definitely that, that's, that's a key theme and it kind of feeds in, I guess, to, to some longer term themes where we're, we're talking to clients about uh, ensuring that uh, the Asia is adequately or appropriately um, represented in their portfolios in the same way as it is in terms of its contribution to global um, economic activity. Uh, and, and for example, uh, you know, recommending that clients do uh, modify their emerging market equity exposure to, to introduce, you know, an all China allocation and carve that out from their broader emerging markets into an emerging market ex-China allocation. Chinpei, what are your thoughts on what Cameron said there? And can you tell us a little bit about your role and what you mean by China A investments? So um, China equities essentially comprise of various share classes. Some are listed uh, onshore in China, uh, which we call China A shares, and some are listed offshore, like in Hong Kong, we call it H shares, and they are also, you know, listed in US the ADRs. Um, so I look after our onshore equity business, uh, which essentially are equities uh, listed in Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange. And what are your thoughts on uh, what Cameron had to say there about the importance of global investors having a bigger exposure to Asia in general and a specific tranche of exposure to China itself? Yes, um, I think that that has been uh, uh, one of the biggest um, team in the emerging market investing. As you know, China today uh, probably accounts for about a third in the MSCI emerging markets index. But if you look at uh, where it stands compared to a global equity uh, allocation, that is still tiny in comparison. So you know, it's like... Um, you know, three percent versus fifty percent of U.S. Uh, in terms of allocation, but but if you look at the size of the economy, uh, China is really the second largest. Uh, it's on its way to be the largest economy in the world, and 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 you know, when you're trying to square off this small allocation in China versus big allocation in U.S., you realize that almost everybody. Uh, is underweight in China today. And therefore, uh, we believe China, uh, in fact, a lot of investors have come to the sense that China deserves a much bigger allocation uh, in the context of seeking uh, long-term uh, growth. Thank you. Well, picking up on that, though, um, Cameron, uh, 2021 was a year where perhaps quite a lot of investors in China got a little bit burned. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it'd been going well for several years. Um, and then suddenly it wasn't. H how uh, investable a market would you say China is for, for 2022 and beyond? Yeah, that, that's that's a great question. And, and you know, I mean, I think for a lot of investors, they did experience significant pain last year with with China and, and emerging markets more broadly, you know, significantly underperforming the United States and, and, and developed markets. Um, but I think the, you know, China definitely does remain investable. Um, I think that that case hasn't really changed. I mean, regulatory risk has always been a factor there. 
Um, and I think it was potentially naive of some investors to, to think that it, it wasn't there. Um, I guess a lot of the, you know, the common prosperity campaign did sneak up um, on a lot of investors and, and take a lot of people by surprise in terms of how quickly some of these uh, regulatory actions were, were taken and subsequently implemented around the, the summer last year. And, you know, particularly, I guess, for investors outside of China, where, you know, that, that sort of thing might take something like months or years to actually happen instead of a, a couple of weeks. Um, but I mean, really, at the end of the day, that's just a function of, of a different sort of set of, of institutional settings in China, um, where decision making practices are, are much more quickly, um, happen much more quickly. And so I think really investors need to, uh, I guess, build that into their investment processes and understand the, the potential um, risks around that and each and every one of their positions in their portfolios, as opposed to um, just giving up on the market altogether, because really there are um, a lot of, uh, you know, good opportunities there. And, and the fact that I guess, you know, I talked before about some, some medium term headwinds with the, the monetary policy divergence, and you've just talked about how a lot of investors got burnt. And so the valuations now are quite attractive in the market. And so I think really this is an opportune time for investors to be uh, increasing their allocation to, to the region for the, the long term upside um, and taking advantage of, of potentially what is a, a bit of a dislocation at the moment. Jim, but what are your thoughts on that? Was, was 2021 the year that sort of reminded us that there's perhaps a lot more risk? You know, we've all been used to the, the reward from Chinese equities, but there's risk there as well. And just picking up on Cameron's point around the fact that government and regulator can move much more quickly in China. As a fund manager, what, what do you do to make sure that your antennae are really, really sensitive when you might have perhaps a month's worth of inf sort of signal coming off rather than six, eight, 12 months, as sure, perhaps might happen sure. in the States? So, so what, what one thing that's fundamentally important as we look at uh, what happened last year is that the, the whole capital market, Ch China has a very young capital market. So, so the capital market development uh, over the last 20 years has accelerated in a, in a great pace. Um, and, and to an extent that I think a lot of regulatory measure that have not caught up with uh, the market developments. And, and if you look at you know, the, some of the regulatory tightenings that, that we saw last year in China, um, they, they, are, they are not anti capitalism at its core, but if you look at it, they are all about um, antitrust issues, uh, which I think you know, a lot of developed markets are also dealing with that. Data privacy, data security issues, workers' welfare, and even you know, kids spending excessive amount of time on video games. And, and these are some of the things that's very fundamental uh, I, I would even say that, you know, uh, to a certain extent, it is like the ESG moment uh, in China uh, uh, last year. So, so as an investor, I think, you know, it, it, it certainly reminds uh, us that we, we got to look at our investment at a longer term perspective and in a more sustainable way. And also, I, I think it's very important to understand um, the kind of uh, regulatory or you know, policy direction, what China wants to achieve uh, you know, uh, and continue to grow in the next 20 or 30 years. I, I think uh, I, will, I will sum it you know, uh, in one word, uh, it's all about long-term sustainability. So that, that's how it got to us you know, in, in the process. And Chimping, when it comes to uh, investing in China, do, do the Chinese authorities need Western capital to develop or are they more interested in Western expertise? And actually, if you wanted to sort of bet on asset management firms and who was going to be big and successful in 20 years time, it, it's going to be local players, not large global organizations with their roots in uh, North America. That's right, Mark. I think it's a very good observation. So I would say China does not need that capital because you know if you look at the size of that capital markets today, um, you know the the amount of foreign capital is just a small proportion. But but it is important to remember, um, you know the the last two three decades of uh, development, uh, the the whole China economy has essentially been financed by banks landings, right? Capital markets has not uh, grown or developed to a stage where it's 
you know, able to function like what we see in other economies. So, so China's Chinese regulators know uh, that it is important to really have a vibrant and healthy capital market. So, so what we have seen, you know, in terms of the market openings, essentially is really to also attract uh, some of these foreign institutional investors into the market. Uh, and, and by doing so, you bring some of the best practices. Uh, you try to institutionalize the behavior of investors. Uh, I think it is those aspects that uh, foreign capitals are much more welcome uh, no, in, in that sense rather than this capital. Thank you. Cameron, I want to come back to what you were saying a little bit earlier about uh, sort of inflation and, and where the, 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 um, how much scope central banks had. I mean, to what, to what extent is Chinese uh, e- economy just at a very different place from that of the US in the, in the cycle? I mean, do, do you see it as a diversifier to US exposure? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um- well, I mean, firstly, just to touch on the, on the first um, sort of question about where, you know, the, the economic conditions, I think, obviously, growth is, is slowing um, in China. And I guess there's potentially two factors at play there. One would be that I say that China is more progressed in its economic cycle than a lot of other economies are. I mean, I guess, you know, we, during the pandemic that, uh, you know, China did handle that um, relatively well in the earlier phases and, and did enable its economy to get back to, um, you know, back to normal, I guess, uh, relatively quickly and therefore move through that early cycle into a mid-cycle phase, um, whereas other economies have been a little bit slower to, to recover. Um, but since then, I guess we have had the impact of uh, the you know, Common Prosperity Campaign, uh, the three red lines and a few other regulatory things that have you know, further weighed on growth um, in the second half of last year, particularly the, the property market. Um, and so I guess you know, there, there is... To some extent, you could argue that this is largely um, self-inflicted. Uh, it's, it's those regulatory actions that have further slowed the economy. So if the, the authorities wanted to move away from that, that they could further um, stimulate growth in, in China. Um, but certainly as a diversifier, I agree with that, um, both in terms of, of China being a diversifier in, in both the equity um, and fixed income space. Um, certainly in, in fixed income, I guess the yields are, are quite attractive, both in, in nominal um, and real terms. Uh, you don't have the same degree of inflation as we were talking about before. And, and therefore, um, I guess you, as well, you've got the, the central bank in an easing cycle as opposed to a, a tightening cycle like the Fed, the ECB and the, um, the Bank of England are. Um, but from an equity perspective as well, I think typically, you know, equities tend to do well when financial conditions are easy, which is typically when a central bank is easing policy. And so there are some tailwinds for, for Chinese equities uh, and certainly emerging market equities more broadly um, relative to, to developed market equities. Hmm. Thank you. Jinping, China and Hong Kong, interesting, are still pursuing this zero COVID strategy. Um, what are the pros and cons of that for uh the economy and potentially for, for 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 companies for corporates. Yeah, so so if we look at China's uh, COVID policies, essentially trying to cut off the transmission chain, right? Um, to to keep it at zero, and of course that that leaves China increasingly isolated in terms of its policy. Uh, but but in the context of um, I think the calculus from a, a, a Chinese government perspective, the, the benefit far outweigh the cost, because if you look at the the, the past two years, the, the number of deaths uh, attributed to COVID in China is five thousand, or in fact less than that number, and compared to nine hundred thousand in US, where the population size is just a quarter of uh, Chinese. Uh, it, it is it is an un, undeniable a uh, 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 public health uh, victory from that angle. So so you could say I, I think you know China probably have a slightly different consideration simply because the, of the vast population size, 1.4 billion people. If you were to open up at just as any other countries uh, today, I, I think you know uh, Beijing University done a study. It is probably like on a daily basis, we're going to see 600,000 cases. I think that will overwhelm any any public healthcare system. So I, I don't think you know, so. So therefore, China is pursuing a slightly different path. So 
right or wrong, we do not know. But what we do know is that you know China does have a vast, a, a huge economy, and 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 this is one key factor that allows it to sustain the zero COVID policy. In fact, the Chinese government has been taking advantage of this policy window to kind of reorient a little bit of that domestic economy uh, to really you know, grow that, that, that domestic part. So the so-called twin uh, circulation policy that you often heard of today in China is really one part about export and then the other part about China. So, so in a way, I, I think you know there's um, uh, overall that that has has worked well. In fact, if we look at the supply chain and other things, I think there are very little disruptions, right? So so in, in a way, uh, I, I think that that has been a a a, a, a reasonable success uh, up to this point. And just a quick follow up, Jinping. Do, what in Implications does it potentially have for Hong Kong, which has traditionally been seen as a very open city? It's obviously much. If you go to it now, I think you've got to you've got to quarantine for two weeks in a hotel. They're pretty strict about it happening to everyone. Is this uh, is this great news for Singapore? Does it does it sort of threaten um, <laughs> Hong Kong's primacy? Uh, uh, well, it's definitely a difficult period for Hong Kong now because I, I think Hong Kong has oriented oriented its on policy towards China, uh, I think uh, very much is it's all about alignment. Uh, but also, I think you know that there's a lot of businesses uh, between Hong Kong and China. So, you know that that they, they have of of course chosen to prioritize you know assessing to China, uh, which means that you got to abide by this uh, zero COVID policy. Um, and, and for Hong Kong, I think you know it, it is. Um, at a slightly tricky situation at this moment uh, because of the Omicron out, out, uh, outbreak. Uh, but you know, hopefully, you know, China is going to send some help down to Hong Kong to help it uh, you know, overcome the current difficulties. Uh, and, and obviously, I think you know, in that sense, that, that's obviously a big contrast between what Hong Kong uh, does and you know, what, what Singapore uh, is doing at this moment. Thank you. Now, we are almost out of time. So what I want to do is get a final thought from each of you. Looking ahead, what's, uh, how would you be uh, suggesting your clients position themselves, uh, either in um, Cameron, in, across North Asia, and then I'll come to you, Chimping, for a final thought around how to position yourself for 2022 in the Chinese equity market. So Cameron, let's come to you first. Yeah, sure. I think that, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier on, the um, relative or the monetary policy divergence that we're seeing between the US and other developed markets and, and China and also, well, Japan for that matter as well, uh, as well as, you know, the, the sell-off that we've seen last year providing quite um, cheap entry points into emerging market equities, um, you know, that, that provides a, a good um, opportunity there where there is a lot of uh, bad news, but, but built into the price for plenty of, of upside from here. Thank you. Jinping, uh as you survey China's onshore equity market at the moment, what what's uh, what would your re- what's your recommended strategy for the year ahead? Um, I think in terms of that, there, there are always plenty of investment opportunities. But I think you know, as investing in China, uh, you know, we look at what are some of the sectors that benefited from some of uh, key policy direction. So, climate change, uh, carbon neutrality is a big theme in China. Uh, it is something that we believe China is going to achieve its carbon neutrality, um, and, and that that it's all you know brings uh, plenty of investment opportunity for investors, uh, EV, solar, and all these. I mean, you know, to name a few. Uh, the other sector that we rely a lot is, is the healthcare. You well, know, is uh, China? Uh, it's having. Uh, uh, it's a uh, population aging issues, uh, you know, and again, you know, this is a multi-decade investment theme, uh, which we believe, uh, you know, China is going to be one of the uh, key countries, um, you know, with uh, advanced medical, uh, you know, uh, standard, uh, you know, and, and that, you know, it, it has a lot of promising investment opportunity out there. Well, thank you for that. We have to, to leave things there. So, um, Chimping Chia and Cameron Sistemans, thank you for joining us. And thank you for watching. Stay with us for a couple or 
about another minute or so, because we've got some information coming up on how you can use this as part of your structured learning. But from all of us here uh, in London, Tokyo, Singapore, and Hong Kong, goodbye for now.